Welcome. I'm Gloria Dittis, Chair of Story Partners, and I want to welcome you to the eighth annual 2021 Salute to Washington Women in Journalism. 2020 disrupted our award ceremony last year, but we moved forward and held a wonderful event last fall. This year, Kathy and I vowed that the show must go on and that we were equally determined to move back to our in-person platform for 2022. You know, I was going through some papers in my office a couple of weeks ago, and I ran across a note card from Gwen Eiffel. She wrote how important these awards were to her colleagues and how much she always enjoyed attending and for starting them. When Gwen was alive, we didn't have a Hall of Fame award, but you could bet she would have been one of our first honorees if we had. Needless to say, that's a card I'm going to continue to cherish. This year's honorees have stepped up during one of the most pivotal moments in our nation's history. From the pandemic to social unrest, to changes to challenges to our democracy, the news cycle of the past year has been historic. And each of these honorees led the way with insightful, accurate, and timely reporting. Today, we are remarkable women for their vast achievements. Nora O'Donnell, Yamish Alcindor, Susan Glasser, and Karen Atia. Hope you will stay on following the awards to, to participate in Zoom breakout discussions with the individual honorees. I want to thank our sponsors who have generously supported this event year after year. For the second year, their support makes possible a donation to the National Association of Black Journalists, which is housed at the Merrill School of Journalism at the University of Maryland. And now, as they say, a word from our sponsors. We're so honored to have Matt Shea and the National Retail Federation back as our title sponsor. Take a moment to watch this video from Matt and the NRF team. Hello, I'm Jill Dvorak, the Vice President of Content and Retail Strategy at the National Retail Federation. We are so delighted to support the eighth annual Washington Women in Journalism Awards. It is an honor to recognize this year's outstanding female journalists who have dedicated their careers to telling important stories and seeking the truth. This past year challenged all of us from every direction, from a global pandemic to economic uncertainty and political and social unrest. Our country needs journalism more than ever. On behalf of National Retail Federation, congratulations and thank you to today's honorees. Thank you so much, NRF. Personally, I'm so thankful that so many of NRF's members quickly turned to, to online retailing. I don't know about you, but I have to admit that online shopping was one of my favorite personal pandemic pastimes. We'd also like to thank our other sponsors who've made the awards presentation possible. Susan Neely and Jill Kozeny with the American Council of Life Insurers, Catherine Luger and the American Beverage Association, Erin Streeter and the National Association of Manufacturers, Danielle Devine and Jane Adams with Johnson & Johnson, Jeannie Wallach and Southern Company, and Suzanne Clark and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And a special thank you for making our beautiful awards. So now I'm delighted to introduce my dear friend, next door neighbor and co-host, Kath, President and CEO of Washingtonian Magazine to present the 2021 Washington Women in Journalism Awards. Thank you so much for joining us today. Kathy? Thank you, Gloria. We are honored on behalf of Washingtonian to recognize these four extraordinary journalists. I am going to kick it right off with Susan Glasser. Susan Glasser is known as a premier foreign policy and politics expert, and indeed she is. Her insight into both arenas are very evident if you read her weekly New Yorker column, Life in Washington. But what many people forget is how Susan earned her stripes. She started her career at Roll Call, where she rose from intern to top editor, covering many issues on the Hill, including Bill Clinton's impeachment. She was prolific even then. There are 73 C-SPAN videos of Susan. The first one tagged in 1992. 
Now, Susan, I don't know if you know that, and, and you and I are the same age, so I know that means you were barely out of college when you started speaking. Um, the word fearless comes to mind, especially um, since after roll call, she spent four years as the co-bureau chief in Moscow for the Washington Post. She covered the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. She was editor of the Outlook and National News section for the Washington Post and editor of Foreign Policy, which I might add won three National Magazine Awards during her tenure. She also co-founded and edited Politico Magazine. But wait, there's more. She has written two books, including the bestseller, The Man Who Ran Washington. Hat tips here to working with her husband, co-author Peter Baker. It is a terrific book if you haven't read it. Susan's take on women in journalism, quote, I spent far more time than I ever could have expected as the only woman at the table. I hope that's going away, but I see enormous structural impediments to women leadership. I don't think we can be complacent about what even looks to be good gains in representation in the last few years." Unquote. For bringing and breaking news around the world, we congratulate Susan Glasser as this year's outstanding journalist in print media. Susan? Oh, well, Kathy, thank you so very much. It is wonderful to be with you, my friend, my fellow Little League mom from long ago. Uh, and I want to thank you and everyone at Washingtonian. Michael's a terrific editor, the entire team who put this great event together. It really is a terrific Washington tradition, and I'm really honored to be a part of it. And especially to my fellow honorees, all of whom are inspiring, inspiring journalists, Yamish, Karen, I'm admirers of your work for many years. And my friend Nora, I must say, one of truly the great accomplishments of my career was, you mentioned my time at Roll Call, my very last act as uh, the child editor of Roll Call was to hire Nora O'Donnell, uh, which has inspired uh, shock and awe when I've uh, told others of it. But uh, what a great career she's had. And it is a great honor of mine to be on this Zoom call with all of you. Uh, look, the last few years uh, have offered no lack of material. It's embarrassing to hear you, Kathy, uh, recount uh, uh, how very long I've been covering Washington, uh, which is to say uh, that merely being old, I suppose, has now become an advantage when it comes to Washington journalism, and especially in the last few years, not to joke, but, you know, the truth is that if you're going to have a, a, a disruptor president blowing things up, it's actually quite useful, I think, to know what things look like before they were blown up. And uh, certainly having been around a long time, that is one benefit for covering the Trump years. And, you know, in, in the last few years, actually, it's been a time, I think, when journalism has returned to first principles. Uh, in some ways, uh, this has been uh, an unthinkable moment. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you know, if journalists are going to be called enemies of the people, if uh, we are talking about things like freedom of speech or the right uh, uh, to vote, uh, we're no longer having kind of technocratic policy discussions uh, that we have now maybe comfortably returned to about uh, which kind of infrastructure policy is best. Uh, but the truth is, it's felt like an honor and a privilege to be able to record these last few years. Uh, you know, history is in some ways the story of the unthinkable uh, happening. And I think uh, for a long time, we got used to history happening in other places uh, and not right here in Washington. Well, history has roared back. And so in many ways, it's been like uh, getting to be a foreign correspondent right here in my own city the last few years. So at any rate, I just want to thank you. Uh, I definitely want to thank my amazing colleagues at The New Yorker, uh, David Remnick, uh, the editor, uh, of course, of the magazine, Mike Luau, the editor of NewYorker.com, Dorothy Wickenden, and particularly my own wonderful uh, friend and editor, David Rode, whose idea uh, this whole uh, venture at The New Yorker was. And I, every week, it's a joy to work with him, not to mention an incredible weekly cast of copy editors and fact checkers and web producers. There's even an amazing audio reader of my column every week, Julia Whelan. I think she has more fans <laughs> than I do. Uh, and it's just, it's, it's great to see the village uh, that's required. And also I have to say my amazing colleagues uh, here in Washington at the New Yorker, like Jane Mayer, I think she was one of your previous honorees, Evan Osnos, Adam Entos, Margaret Talbot. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost an embarrassment 
of riches and certainly a joy for me to work with all of them. I also have to give a quick shout out since this is an event dedicated to women to my mother who is still working every single day at the age of 78 and who taught me very early on uh, that you can have a career and do what you want to do and also have four children. Uh, so I'm very grateful to her uh, for giving me that example. And finally, I thought I wanted to thank, in addition, uh, all of those who really labored every single day over the last four years as journalists to cover the Trump White House. Uh, without them, I wouldn't have been able to write my column. Uh, they absorbed uh, you know, all of the real heat of uh, covering this most unique White House in this most unique moment in time. And of course, that does include my partner and co-author, uh, Kathy, you mentioned Peter Baker. And I guess I'll just leave you with this uh, moment in the, the annals of a, a would-be feminist covering Washington. One morning, we woke up in September of 2019 to find, uh, as he often did, that President Trump had decided to do a little bit of hate tweeting about journalists. And that morning, uh, Peter and I were the targets. And, and the president wrote wrote about Peter Baker of the failing New York Times uh, and his wife, quote, an even bigger Trump hater than himself. The only problem was that Peter's name was included and mine wasn't. And I must tell you how crestfallen I was. Can you imagine in 2019 being a plus one on the enemies list? Uh, I really, I felt like there's still a lot of work to do, ladies. Next time, I'm hoping that the president gets my name right. But thank you again, Kathy, and thank you and congratulations to all my fellow honorees. Thank you, Susan, and that is a great ending. <laughs> Okay, uh, let us move on to Yamish Alcindor. You've probably seen Yamish as the White House correspondent for PBS NewsHour, or perhaps as the new host of Washington Week. And if somehow you missed her there, you've seen her on NBC News or MSNBC. Yamish has a gift for delivering stories. And that gift started early. Before college even, while she was interning at the Miami Herald, there was an assault at a local Walmart. Employee against employee, a big story. Yamish had a well-placed source. Her brother happened to be working at that Walmart at the time. She dug in, she interviewed the people, she got the story and landed a byline on the front page of the Miami Herald at the age of 18. She went on to work for many storied publications, including the Seattle Times, the New York Times, Newsday, but also Mayhe, the local English newspaper in Botswana. She was inspired by mentor Gwen Eiffel to be a civil rights journalist. She is that, and even has a movie credit to show for it with her documentary, Trouble with Innocence, about a man wrongly convicted of murder but it is her reporting skills that have set her apart. They are vast. Everything from being a beat cop reporter on Long Island to covering Sandy Hook, to Trayvon Martin, to Ferguson, to presidential campaigns, and even moderating one of the debates in 2020, which I think we can all agree was no easy task. Our last president lashed out against her many times, but here's the thing, Yamish, always kept her cool. Glamour Magazine called her Mona Lisa Calm. I love that. Perhaps that is why she has a record 1.2 million Twitter followers. Alcindor says, quote, never listen to anybody who tells you you can't do something. I've been told that I didn't look the part, that I wasn't the right weight, and I wasn't the right skin color for the job that I have now. But if you persevere and you believe in yourself, then you can do whatever you put your mind to. For persevering to ask the tough questions with Mona Lisa Calm, Yamish Alcindor is this year's outstanding journalist in broadcast television. Congratulations, Yamish. She comes to us from the basement of the White House. I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Catherine, for that amazing introduction. I got emotional and I, I thought maybe because we weren't in person that I wouldn't be so moved, but I, I am I'm almost near tears because 
it is surreal to me that I'm in concert, it, it, that I'm part of this event with the Nora O'Donnell, with the Susan Glasser, with the Karen, who was an, uh, the editor for Jamal Khashoggi, who was who showed so much courage. I admire you women so much. I would not be a journalist if it wasn't for all of the pioneering um, things that so many women before me did, including you, Nora, um, watching you every night, helming the chair of CBS News, being an amazing anchor. Um, it is, I used to work with Peter Baker, of course, so I spent a lot of time asking Peter, is this normal? When I was covering <laughs> President Trump and he he would always say, no, it's it's not normal, Yamish. Um <laughs> It is truly an honor to, to be doing this work. This last year was just so tough. It was, um, it was, there was so much that we had to go through. There were so many people who were so scared and to be honored among so many women who were doing the work of journalism. Um, we were pressing presidents for answers. We were out in the far corners of the country um, interviewing people, interviewing immigrants about their lives and, and the people who couldn't stay home. There were so many moments where I sat back and thought, I am so proud to be a journalist in this moment, um, watching women like, like of course, Nora and Susan and, Kat and, and Karen, but also of Abby Phillip and Margaret Tollib and, and Ashley Parker and so many women that have been honored um, by Washingtonian and by story partners. The thing that I'm, that's sticking with me as I, as I think about this is what Susan talked about and, and her mom. Um, I would not be where I am without having grown up with a woman, my mom, a Haitian immigrant who came to this country in the 70s without speaking English, who then went on to earn a PhD um, and who spent three decades as a social worker, taking me to take your child to work day, where she was asking tough questions, where she was trying to help people's lives, where she was showing me what it meant to raise children on your own while also going into tough neighborhoods, but also treating people with empathy and also treating people with, with, with dignity. It is that that has grounded my reporting. It's trying to have a human connection with people and trying to make people empathize with other people who they may not naturally connect with. Um, I'm thinking about Gwen Ifill, who, who Gloria talked about so, so eloquently about the advice that she gave me um, and about how lucky I was to have the mentorship of Gwen and, and her friend, Athalia Knight, who, who worked as a longtime, white, a longtime Washington Post reporter, um, the first, I remember meeting Gwen and, and trying to give her my nickname, Mish, to try to put her at ease because my name, Yamish, is always such a, a mouthful. And she told me, don't let anyone nickname you. Be comfortable in your own skin. And that has stuck with me so much as I've gone from print to broadcast news to understanding that whatever people say about you, saying that you're not confident enough or not pretty enough or not skinny enough, that all of those things don't matter if you know yourself and you're comfortable with yourself and you lean into yourself. Um, and a great advice that Gwen gave me that I'm, I'm leaning into as I as I now take the helm of of a, of a show of the show that she loves so much, Washington Week. It's don't let yourself be small. Don't make yourself small. Um, she she breathed confidence into me so many times where I would call her rattled about whether or not I could actually be on Meet the Press and sit at a table with so many amazing people who my mom had grown up watching. Um, and she told me every time you earn this, you deserve this, lean into this, you you belong. And I think so many times I've been lucky to have women who have told me you belong and you're, it's okay to be ambitious. Um, so many times the word ambition is thrown as an insult to women. But I know in looking at Nora and looking at Susan and looking at Karen, what are you but ambitious? What are you but fair and smart and brilliant and also people that are achieving all that you wanna achieve? Um, and to be to be named and to be awarded this with you is is so touching to me. And as I think about the, where I'm going now with Washington Week and wanting to expand it and thinking about sitting at an anchor desk and being nervous a lot, um, I know that because all of you women are doing the work that you're doing, that I can do the work that I'm doing. So I'm so grateful to be um, given this outstanding journalism award in broadcast news. It is blowing my mind as someone who grew up writing short stories who thought I would be a newspaper person forever that I was able to make the switch to, to broadcast news and to be able to now be an anchor, which I think is just uh, a surreal experience. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much. I feel so blessed to be a part of this, of this group and, and to be awarded this. Thank, thank you, Yamish. Next up, Karen Atia. 
The Ghanaian American and Texas native writer serves as global opinion editor for the Washington Post. At least I think she still does, because just on Thursday, the Post announced she would also become a regular columnist on race, international affairs, culture, and human rights. Congratulations, Karen. Karen is a staunch human rights advocate. It was she who recruited Jamal Khashoggi to write for the Washington Post, and as Yamish mentioned, she was his editor. Karen has written extensively on his murder and with her colleague David Ignatius won the George Polk Award for their writings on the subject. When asked what drew her to journalism, she says, quote, I realized I was interested in advocacy and speaking up for people who needed it. I thought maybe I wanted to go into international development and then found myself disillusioned with that whole idea and everything came together. I realized I'm just really interested in people in their stories. It's a vocation for a lot of us. It's not a job. We could have chosen a lot of other things that would have made us materially more comfortable, but it's so cool that I get to be curious for a living. For using her curiosity to shine a light on people and issues that need it, Karen Atia is a Washingtonian star to watch. Congratulations, Karen. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, Gosh, uh, again, and I'm, I'm so, so uh, honored and, and also slightly emotional to also be in this virtual room with Yamish and, and Nora and, and Susan and the people who have been following him and watching and, and trying to emulate for such a long time. Um, so again, thank you guys. And I think a lot of the, the thread has already been um, sown in, in this conversation, which is about... Um, <sighs> just about really what, what calls us to do this and, and the <laughs> courage sometimes that we have to draw upon every day, whether or not it's, it's questioning the president, questioning President Trump, having to deal with attacks uh, from on high, having to deal with attacks from increasing attacks, especially on women journalists, as we do uh, this work. And I get asked a lot, um, how do you do this? I don't know how, how you do this. And um, I think for me, a lot of it uh, comes down to, it comes down to people. And in my uh, relatively you know, short career uh, in Washington, I've had the opportunity to see the wide range of the human experience. I've seen that we are capable, humans can be capable of sheer cruelty. I've been to uh, places in Nigeria where Boko Haram is devastated communities. I've seen the heartache when people's family members have been, been killed by terrorists. Um, and of course, with Jamal's uh, murder, um, those are some of the darkest uh, times in my life. But I have also seen the human capacity for compassion, for kindness, for even beauty to come out of the darkness and resilience of the human spirit. And I think that is um, a lot of what drives me to keep going and to keep doing um, what I do. And that is to, to show the fullness um, of what it means to be human, honestly, no matter where you come from, what your skin color is, what your social class is. It is that we all deserve a voice, we all deserve dignity, and we all deserve uh, to be here. Um, so with that, I think, um, I, I'd like to thank, it's been a village <laughs> to support me in what I do. Um, Fred Hyatt, um, Ruth Marcus, uh, Mike Larrabee, Eli Lopez, um, David Hoffman, uh, and one thing that Fred, um, told me in the beginning of my career at, at the Post, particularly when it comes to editorial writing and, and opinions writing, is that we have the opportunity and the privilege to not just write about the world as it is, uh, but to write about the world as it should be. And it is this perhaps undying <laughs> optimism of trying to write for change, trying to write for, for um, again, for human dignity that still drives me. And, uh, and that said, I mean, um, my, my family's on this call uh, to thank them, mom and dad, 
it has been a, a challenging time uh, for the last year or so, but I, I come from a proud daughter of Nigerian and Ghanaian uh, immigrants. My grandmother was, was, didn't achieve a high school education. My other grandmother was a market woman, so to be able to sit here um, and, and be able to speak and write and be curious for a living is, is such a blessing. So again, um, thank you all so much. Congratulations to all my co-winners. Um, again, to joining y'all from the hot, <laughs> hot North Texas right now. I hope to see, see you all soon. And, um, and yes, ladies, let's keep on the fight because yes, we have a new administration, but there are so, so, so many battles um, to be fought here in this country. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. <laughs> Nora O'Donnell. Nora is our hometown girl. She was born in Washington, D.C., although she grew up mostly in Texas, saved some time in South Korea. Yes, South Korea. And that is where she got her career start being on air. In elementary school, Nora started by giving videotaped English lessons for the Korean Educational Development Institute. Lucky for us, that little taste of being on air stuck. College brought her back to Washington, where I have, where like Susan Glasser, she started working at Roll Call. Now Susan hired her. She went on to NBC, where she spent 12 years reporting for the Nightly News, the Today Show, Dateline, you name it. Then she went on to serve as CBS's White House correspondent and became co-anchor of CBS This Morning in 2012 also then the lead political reporter for 60 Minutes. But it was in July of 2019 that Nora became managing editor and anchor of the CBS Evening News. And the only the third woman to sit in that seat. And to take advantage of her strengths and ties in DC, she helped move the Evening News to Washington. The first time that either ABC, CBS, or NBC called Washington home full time. Thank you for that, Nora. Mm -hmm. Nora has covered six presidential elections. She's traveled around the globe to interview some of the world's most important leaders, including <clears throat> five US presidents. Quote, there's an art to asking a question, says Nora. Spend the extra time working on your questions because they're incredibly important and can elicit different responses, end quote. We would be here all day if I ran through the people she's interviewed. I'll highlight a few. South Korean President Moon Jae-in for his first interview in office, His Royal Highness Prince Harry of Wales, Nobel Peace Prize winner Malala, Roger Goodell at the height of the league's domestic violence scandal, and the Dalai Lama. Not to mention in 2018, she spent a week reporting from Saudi Arabia, Arabia, where she interviewed Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The conversation was his first and only American television interview. But those are people. Nora's real talent is bringing us the news. She has reported from the scenes of Hurricane Dorian and Harvey. She's covered mass shootings in Las Vegas and Annapolis, Maryland in El Paso, Texas, and she covered the country's largest migrant processing facility on the southern border, the Boston Marathon bombing, and of course, she was at the Pentagon on 9-11. She has been named by Washingtonian one of the 100 most powerful women in Washington. She has won Emmys for her election night coverage and her six-month investigation and report on sexual assault at the Air Force Academy. She says she's never covered a year in her entire journalistic career like this last year, from the ongoing COVID pandemic, the George Floyd protests around the world, to the contested 2020 presidential election and the storming of the U.S. Capitol by insurgents. O'Donnell says, quote, journalism is more important than ever. We agree. For bringing the network to where the news happens, and for showing the world that journalism and truth matter. We are proud to give the Woman in Journalism Hall of Fame Award to Nora O'Donnell. Nora. Wow. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. And um, oh my gosh, I'm so incredibly honored and, and humbled by this recognition. And um, when I told my kids uh, this morning that I was getting the Hall of Fame award, they were like, how old are you? <laughs> and they were like, and isn't the Hall of Fame for professional athletes who are retired? <laughs> and of course, um, surviving and thriving in journalism takes a lot of stamina, just like a professional athlete. So thank you very much for this um, award. Um, I do want to, to thank you, Kathy Merrill, for this and to Gloria Dittis um, and the Washingtonian for celebrating the remarkable work by women in journalism in our nation's capital. And I am so proud to be associated with women who lift up others and use their voice for change. Um, so I want to extend my congratulations to Yamish and of course to Karen, uh, congratulations to both of you. And it is especially meaningful to share this recognition with Susan Glasser, who yes, hired me for my first job as a reporter at Roll Call 25 years ago. So thank you, Susan, I really appreciate that. And I think as all of you know, um, as a young journalist, the first time um, that you see your byline in a newspaper, it changes you. And um, when you see publicly the words that you write and the reporting that you've done and your name next to it, it changes the way you feel about your work. So thank you, Susan, um, for giving me that boost 25 years ago. Um, I think the message and the value behind these awards is that together as a community, we can be stronger and we can help one another. We can be a support system for one another. And I would never have made it anywhere here at CBS News or in broadcast journalism without the incredible network of support. Some of you probably know that Madeleine Albright quote, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. I like to put two exclamation points after that. Um, my own interest in journalism also came from my family, like many of you. I'm an army brat. My family moved around. We lived in Germany and South Korea and in San Antonio, Texas. But the one constant really in my life was the news. My parents revered journalists. Um, they read the newspaper and magazines were all over our house. And my mom always said that, that I always had big, big dreams. And um, I think that's where it all started. We had two traditions in our house, church and 60 Minutes, and television, and specifically journalism, were really my window to the world. And I think it was the place where my dreams began. Um, and it wasn't just the news that I watched on TV that inspired me. It was the voices that I came to admire, women in journalism. You know, I think seeing people that look like you and people you can relate to inspire you. And so it was women like Barbara Walters and Oprah Winfrey and watching them sort of solidified this deep aspiration within me that, wow, these women could travel the world and interview uh, the most influential uh, and famous people in the world. Um, today, as the anchor and managing editor of the CBS Evening News, I think about those who have come before me. There's only two women, as you mentioned, Kathy, who have solo anchored an evening newscast, and those are Katie Couric and Diane Sawyer. Um, when I got this job, they both reached out to me, um, as did uh, Barbara Walters, and those are some of the most meaningful notes of support that I ever received. Um, also, Walter Cronkite, um, one of CBS's greats and the most trusted man in America, held this job. And he had said, he said something that I repeat often. He said, journalism is what we need to make democracy work. And I believe that with my whole heart. Journalism is under attack. Civility is under attack. Truth is under attack. And we can fix that. We have a responsibility to fix that. I do think that journalism plays a more vital role in our country today than maybe it ever has in our history. And Cronkite was right about that, but it wasn't really his idea. The idea originated with our founders. They enshrined the role of a free press within the Constitution. They believed it was so important that they made it the First Amendment, not the 11th Amendment. And it was James Madison, of course, who suggested, let's take it a step further, that the press preserve, quote, the right of freely examining public character. Yamish, that's what you've done for the past several years. Susan, you've done that. Karen, you've done that with world leaders. So I hope that all of us can continue to inspire and support young women who wanna be journalists. Um, and uh, 
you know, I recently heard someone say, believing in yourself is your great superpower. So it's an honor to be among so many superheroes because I think all of you believe deeply, not only in yourself, but in the work that you do. I do wanna give a few shout outs to um, people, as I mentioned, you don't make it anywhere without the people around you. Um, to Susan Zerinsky, our past president, um, who has an illustrious uh, half century career in journalism, uh, has been a great mentor. To Neeraj Kamlani and Wendy McMahon, our presidents of CBS News. Um, to our executive producer of this show, Jay Shaler. To our other producers on this program, Adam Verdugo and Julie Morris and Olivia Rinaldi. And then many of you can't see, I know I'm lucky to have a crew here, um, right? <laughs> in the room and behind the scenes. And that's why the set looks so incredibly beautiful because these are incredible professionals who've been here every day through this pandemic. We just found out yesterday they didn't have to wear masks anymore <laughs> in the studio. So that was a big win and a big change for us, even though everybody's vaccinated. Um, and so uh, finally, I'll just end, end with this. Um, I do believe that the quality of your life is built around the quality of relationships. So I really do commend you, um, Kathy and Gloria and Washingtonian for celebrating journalists, for building relationships with other incredible, strong and supportive uh, women. So for this honor and distinction, I'm truly grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Thank you to all four of you for keeping the flame alive and carrying it forward. And thank you, Gloria, for co-hosting this. We love, I mean, doing this together. We're going to send everyone into breakout rooms now for some conversation. I, Gloria and I would especially like to thank our breakout room sponsors, the National Retail Federation, ACLI, the American Council of Life Insurers, ABA, the American Beverage Association, and Johnson & Johnson. Let's have some good conversations and all remember and how incredible these women are and what they do for us and for our country. I'll see you in the break room. Thank you so much. <laughs>